countdown to eternity starts now. Well, hello, my dear brothers and sisters. We want to welcome you to another episode of Countdown to Eternity. And I have to tell you, we have got quite the show planned for you. Again, I am here with my friend David Tall. Are you guys? Uh, and we have, listen, there's a lot going on. We had recently something pretty incredible take place. And when I say incredible, meaning uh, a lot to take in, and that is senior Iranian officials were killed in Syria, right? And pretty much from what we understand, it wipes out their Eastern command. And let me read you a portion of this uh, because this is uh, this is a pretty amazing story if it's true. And, and the sources uh, seem to be con confirming, right? It doesn't have any independent uh, confirmation yet, uh, but I think we're, it's coming fast and furious. And it says this, it says, 11 senior members of Iran's Revolutionary Guards in Syria were killed in an overnight attack on Damascus International Airport. Now, this is uh, the Saudi Arabian uh, news network that's actually reporting this. And by the way, just so that everybody knows, this attack took place just a few days before the New Year's. Okay, uh, this this okay. Uh, this uh, bombing. Okay. So it says this, according to the report, which has no confirmation, most of the officers who made up the senior command of the Revolutionary Guards and other pro-Iranian militias in eastern Syria were killed in the attack. Now, some of you might say, James, if you're going to talk about a story as significant like this, why would you talk about a story that doesn't seem to have independent confirmation? And I'll tell you why, because very likely it's true, but we're not going to confirm that because we don't have independent confirmation. But I do want to say this. It's a great leeway into discussing all the insanity that we're seeing happening right now in the Middle East and the fact that we are watching a lot of senior leaders being assassinated right now who are orchestrating these types of attacks against Israel. Let me read this other uh, paragraph to you. It says the Saudi channel also claimed that the commander of Iran's forces in eastern Syria, Norat Rashid, was injured in the attack. The report further claimed that the attack was aimed against a delegation that had landed at the airport and met with other senior figures. The sources claimed that this was a more significant event than the elimination of former uh, Quds Force commander uh, Qasem al Soleimani uh, f about four years ago. Uh, now look at look at this. It says another strike took place on Thursday, according to the Syrian army, which laid blame on Israel. According to the Syrian army, Israel attacked targets in the south of the country as well as the Damascus airport area. But air defense systems managed to shoot down most of the missiles. It was also said that the attack left destruction and two Syrian soldiers were injured. Okay. I want to say a couple of things about this statement, okay. and then I want, to, I want to open it up to you, okay? There are many read-between-the-line issues here. Okay. When people talk about Damascus being attacked, I want people to understand this is normal now, okay? The airport in Damascus and the airport in Aleppo specifically are regularly getting bombed because they serve as conduits for major weapons being handed to Hezbollah, to bring into the north from Iran. We know it. We understand it. We saw great evidence of it during the Turkish earthquakes and the Syrian earthquakes. We, we know exactly what's going on. So when we hear about Damascus being bombed, everybody tends to want to get really excited about the news because they think this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 17. But I want to say this really quickly about Isaiah 17. When we talk about a ruinous heap and when we talk about Damascus, I believe that what we read about in the Bible is a slow rolling process. Let me just explain what I mean when I say this. Damascus can only be bombed so much. And when it gets bombed again and again and again and again, eventually we're going to see a ruinous heap. And every single time we read these stories, we're getting one uh, place closer to this. Here's the other thing that I want to mention. And many people would think that I would be talking about the fact that Israel is a, it's kind of a big deal because Israel's attacking, uh, you know, the leaders of all of these hostile organizations we shouldn't be surprised about that. That That's you know, par for the course for Israel. But what's interesting, and it's a discussion that I also want you to comment on, is the fact that there's no way in the world that Israel would be allowed to do any of the stuff that they're doing had it not been from them getting direct permission from Russia. Okay, which, great. by the way, is kind of controlling Syria in many ways. I just threw a lot your way, David. But can we uh, unwrap this okay. a little bit? Let's talk about this for a second. Let's let's go a little bit deeper. And do we know what when we talk about Syria, we know where we are. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay, we know what's happening in Syria. So 
This is not the Syria that we know in 73. This is not the Syria that we know in, in 81. This is not the Syria. This is a completely different Syria that has completely fallen apart as a result of the, the civil war that's been taking place in Syria. I think something like 2 million people have died in that civil war. Easily. By the way, killed by the Syrian regime. Is anybody demonstrating with Syrian flags anywhere no. in the world today? No. Okay. No. Uh, Hundreds of, uh, I mean, something like two and a half million Syrian refugees are now in Jordan. And I'm talking about all the Syrians. So Syria is not a nation that has a, how do you say, a, a border that is controlled and a government that is in, in control of what's going on. Syria is like a free-for-all. It's, like it's, it's like a wild, wild west kind of a situation. So in this area, this is in control. Up in the north, the Turks are in control. On the east, it's, it's more like, so, sir, there's this situation. And by the way, a lot of people don't know there are American forces inside Syria. Oh, yeah. Okay, inside Syria itself. There's American forces in Iraq, but there's also American forces inside Syria. So in this hodgepodge and, and free-for-all, okay, this has also become the main staging area for the resistance against Israel. Okay, so, so the Hezbollah is on the border with Israel, which means... A lot of things can't be done there. So Syria has become the staging area. And the more the Iranians have control of areas in Syria, the more they're playing games. By the way, they're also part of the proxy war with Saudi Arabia. So the war between Sunni and Shiite, the war between the East and the West, be the war between Israel and Iran is all actually taking place on the ground in Syria as we speak. And okay. that's the backdrop I think people have to have in, in that. Okay, and let me complicate the backdrop a little bit because we also know this for a fact. We've been able to establish it not only in Jordan but in Syria as well. The United States of America has set up training facilities that are designed to train Palestinian forces, Palestinian officers, for lack of a better term. Which, which is, it, it greatly complicates things. It's kind of beside the point. So let's talk about this. Why does Israel have to get permission from Russia to do something like this? I, I, can, can we just talk okay. about that so, first? So one of the things that have kind of happened in, in Syria as a result of all the different changes, okay, uh, in this free-for-all, uh, the Syrian regime, in order to stay in power, had to pull in assets from three main sources or pull in support from three main sources. Uh, the first source was Iran, okay, and and applied as far as weapons and as far as things like that. S Syria, the Syrian regime would not exist without that, okay. The second is to give it an overall international umbrella because they were fighting against, okay, America is a part of this, is the Russians. Now, the Russians have a very deep interest in Syria because there is a massive Russian naval base in the northern part of Syria, on the Mediterranean Sea, it's the only connection that Russia actually has, or the Mon base that they have, and and it allows Russia to actually project power all over the Middle East. So it's a naval and and an air force base, big massive air, sub, air force base. Think about I don't know, uh, Guam for for the United States next to Japan. Yeah. Okay. So so that's one big massive asset. So Russia has an asset. And in order to keep that asset, Russia has been paying the Syrians with um, air defense systems yep. that are kind of spread out around uh, both their bases, and it has given them to, to, to the Syrians, which means that an, an Israeli F-35, in order to do anything inside Syria, has to be able to maneuver through these Russian air defenses. Now, the question is, can they do that without the Russians knowing? Probably not. Can the Russians do anything to stop? Probably not. And I think there's this, um, we won't fire at you in order to make sure that nobody knows if we can hit you or not if yeah. we do fire. Yep. Because we're selling the, uh, the S-400s uh, to people all over the world. And if we fire at an Israeli F-35 and it doesn't get shot down, then we have lost sales of F-35s to India and to other, to Pakistan and to whoever, whoever we're trying to sell it to. So there's this, this kind of dance around between uh, all these different factors. And Iran is using that as a place to kind of stage and, and kind of set up, which is why what happened in Damascus is critical. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and a little a little note on the F thirty fives and the uh, the F sixteen specifically the F sixteen that Israel flies. 
Um, both those planes have very different purposes. Mm -hmm. The F-16s, um, and this, this is going to sound crazy, but if you were to get in a close quarter uh, dogfight with an F-35 and you were in an F-16 and both pilots were equally <laughs> capable, the F-16 would win every single time. Yes. And the reason why they'd win every single time is their maneuverability, some of the things that they're capable of doing, that kind of a thing. So some people say, well, the, F the F-35 is the most uh, powerful and unique. Actually, the F-22 is the most powerful and unique aircraft that United States has, but it's the most powerful and unique aircraft that uh, Israel has. But the reason why the F-35s are so much more powerful in many ways is because if that F-16 were 100 miles away from that F-35, the F-35 would destroy that F-16 before the F-16 even knew that the F-35 was in the area. That's a problem. And that's that's what makes them so big, which is why the significant variable with the new S-400 batteries are, are important between Russia and, of course, the United States of America. And they both have equal interests, by the way, because you brought up a really great point, right? Russia also loses their ability to sell those things if they cannot sell the fact that they were designed to uh, to deal with long-range interceptions, which they're supposedly supposed to do that, even though we don't see a lot of real evidence of them doing that. They have they have done some things with MiGs from a pretty decent distance. But, you know, when you start looking at the capability of an F-35 and what it can do from a certain distance, it's 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 not even a comparison. So if we go back to Syria, Syria has become, how do you say, the staging area for all of these different elements that are playing uh, a role in there, including, by the way, Israel. Okay. And Israel very carefully has been eliminating and taking out threats to Israel's defense, okay, in, inside Syria. On the whole, though, Israel's been careful not to target people, both Syrians or even Hezbollah. The idea was to take out infrastructure but keep the death toll down as much as possible. It seems that Israel has given up on that. Well, I think that they, they don't have a choice. I think they've been forced into a whole new process. You know, when you say given up, I mean, I think that they, they're kind of forced. Their hands were forced because of Hamas and what's going on with the underground tunnels. Uh, I mean, am I wrong about that? No, but here's the thing. Israel has still tried not to, how do you say, not to get into an all-out shooting war with Iran or not to even to take a chance of an all-out shooting war. So we have not been targeting Iranian assets or Iranian uh, military personnel uh, up until now. Uh, but I think something has happened in the West, and because uh, these are not the first Iranian elements that were taken out. I mean, Soleimani was taken out, I think, in Damascus Airport also. Yes, that's right. It, it okay. would have been. the Yes, that's right. And they were taken out. He was taken out not by Israel, but by the Americans. Okay, so um, uh, le can we talk about this special guard that was taken out in um, uh, the Republican Guard that was taken out in Syria, uh, reportedly taken out? Now, these are the most elite of the elite. Right. Um, I'm scrolling through this article to find if there's any naming of these people. But my understanding is the Republican card, the Republican Guard in Iran directly answered to Khomeini. Yeah. Is that correct? To, to the to the how do you say the head of Iran? Yeah. OK. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Because I think uh, they're, they're the ones that, that work with him directly, directly. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think that um, many of these people. Uh, interact in different ways with different leaders, and uh, the the butcher of Tehran uh, is no exception when we talk about Aisi and everything that's going on there. But I, I bring this up because it, it would seem as though Israel is beginning to pick off more and more and more and more of these leaders, and Iran is becoming more and more upset by it. But here's my question. This thing with Damascus and what just happened in Damascus, why in the world is... Uh, I guess the, the question is, why is Iran not wanting to talk about this? Why are they not even admitting that this happened? Why aren't they seeking to propagandize it? You know, okay. And it's very likely that this, is re that this really happened because Saudi Arabia news is very good at getting these stories right. So there, there's, I think, two elements to this. And, and the way I like to use is um, think about gang war mentality or, or gang or, or criminal gang mentality, Okay. You've got the gang boss. You got the you know the mafia boss. I mean the don up there on the top, but he doesn't pull the trigger on anybody. I mean he's going to be using his flunkies wherever they are to do what he needs to do. The thing is that he has to both project power to the official government, to the police, to the citizens. You have to be afraid of us, but he also has to project power to other gangs in the area. Okay, and. 
the one of the easiest ways to do this is by putting a, a distance between you and the event. So if you wink a hit on somebody, okay, everybody knows that you ordered the hit, but you're not the one who pulled the In trigger. In the middle of it, the day-to-day, -day, yeah. Exactly. You're not the one who pulled the trigger. So you can come to the to police and say, I didn't do it, you know, and you can come to uh, um, whoever you knew to, but the other bosses that were hit know that you do it. Mm. So so you've got this double, You they, they're playing this game of, okay, w we want people to know who we are because we want the influence that comes with that, but we don't want to be uh, responsible for the results yeah. of what we do. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. By the way, it, everybody does that. Israel, I mean, I, I could give you a classic example about Israel's so-called nuclear capability yeah. where yeah. – where we want the people who know need to know to know what they need to know, but we're not saying officially that that was us. We're keeping a, a yeah, distance. That, yeah, that's right. That makes sense. Okay, so now what's happened is this: we played the game, but now Israel's taking the gloves off, and now Israel's saying to Iran, "We have known all this time it was you, but since there was a difference, we have been careful not to instigate direct repercussions on you and the people who are running this." But Israel's taking the gloves off. Okay, um, let, let's let's uh, take this a little bit further. Okay, okay. Uh, the day of this recording uh, is uh, Tuesday, so the day you're hearing this is Wednesday. So Monday, uh, which would have been New Year's Day, uh, Hamas has a political bureau. Of course, everybody knows this, right? Yeah. And the second in command in that political bureau was assassinated by Israel. We we know that him and his whole group and his whole of, crew. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can we talk about the significance of that? Uh, of the of who he was or the, the idea that it was? The idea that it was. Okay, who he was is also significant. In, let's start off with who he was. Yeah. Okay, the guy's the second, he, the, there's a political wing and there's a military wing in Hamas, and Khaled Mashal is the head of the political wing there. They're the politicians, basically, or the, the representatives. They're the ones who do the negotiations. They're the ones who talk to the different governments. And this guy was the second in command or the second or the vice head or the vice ambassador if you want to put it that way of the hamas in the world he was uh, the the political wing is the secretary of state he's the vice secretary of state but he lives in beirut beirut is lebanon lebanon is hezbollah so he's living in the middle of the dahia neighborhood in beirut which is the hezbollah headquarters that's where nasrallah i mean he's had dinner with nasrallah many times i mean you know they met together for mm -hmm. for coffee at the, you know, the, the Beirut Starbucks. I'm not supposed to Starbucks, but you get the idea. <laughs> but he's the go-between between Hezbollah and Hamas, which, by the way, if I'd have said 20 years ago that Hezbollah and Hamas were going to have coffee together, you would say you're crazy because one is Shia and one yeah, is we, Sunni. We would have all laughed. We would have yeah. all laughed. But he, yeah. he has created that dynamic. Yep. So they are interconnected. Hamas is using Lebanon and the Hezbollah uh, umbrella in Lebanon to attack Israel from the north and to keep Israel kind of connected to, to the north. And again, Hezbollah hasn't pulled it all out on its capabilities, but they are pinpricking Israel from the north, and they just did it again about two hours ago. Yeah. So he is sitting in Beirut, and he is coordinating between the Hamas and Hezbollah on one side and the Iranians on the other side. Okay, so why is it significant that he was assassinated? Because I'm going to go somewhere with this uh, and his team. Okay, because what we're trying to do is to break the connection between the Hezbollah, okay, basically, and the Hamas. We're trying to kind of put, put a, a wrench into that mechanism, and we're trying to tell the Hamas, and again, this is Israel starting to do what it did after the Munich attack. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yeah. Which is basically saying, okay, I, I, you are not going to be exempt from Israeli repercussions by the fact that you're living in another Arab state. Yeah, un undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. And, and again, both of those, I think the Hamas is kind of surprised that this happened, that Israel did infiltrate and that it's happening. And more than anything, they're all kind of shivering. Now, don't get me wrong. Sinwar is probably very happy because Sinwar and, and this oh, guy yeah. were, were rivals. Yeah. Okay? And if Sinwar 
hopefully will die in the next week, two weeks, month, okay? Then he was supposed to be part of the, the new government yeah. there, yeah. and Israel is taking that out. By the way, um, I'd be very curious to understand what's going to happen to the public figures that are now in uh, Qatar and, and how yeah. that's going to work. Yeah, I I would not be surprised if we start seeing them pick off every you know every now and again. I think that there's some real serious political implications with Qatar that we have to be looking at and that we should be yeah. concerned with. Uh, but Israel I, is worried about doing it with Qatar. I don't think because of capabilities, but because we're still using Qatar in the in the uh, interaction. Yeah, it's the it's the general perception as well. Uh, they're 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 kind of a big deal. And then uh, Qatar is the heart of a lot of the fake media that continues to send the propagative type of nonsense that people hear concerning that. So what what I think Israel is doing is taking the gloves off the proxy war. Okay. So okay. they're so they're defacing the proxy war. Exactly. That's a really good way of putting it. I think that's a really smart a sm if you were to encapsulate it all, it's a really smart way of putting it. Um I, can I can I throw out a little biblical yep. theory on this? No, please. So I think biblically speaking, this is going to go into this temporary peace picture uh, more and more. I think that what Israel is doing right now is they are they are uh, helping to create clear delineations with the rest of the world in understanding who are terrorists and who aren't, and who are people who are real political actors. Uh, bringing in a team of diplomats, right, a diplomatic corps uh, versus people who are just seeking the destruction of a nation. And I think that eventually the uh, the economics of this whole uh, region is going to kick in. It's going to be more powerful. And I think the mindset of people like MBS uh, in Saudi Arabia is going to prevail more. And the only reason why I believe that is because when you read Ezekiel 38, the, the the attackers of Israel are going to be friends with Israel. Hmm. Is, Israel's going to be uh, very surprised by the attack that takes place. Um, and, and, and to think about this, the only way that I can imagine Israel being surprised about another attack, at, at an attack that's at that level, has to be, has to be centered around the fact that they had, have achieved total peace. And and that in many ways they feel like there's 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 nothing knocking on their door anymore. So yes, and and here's, it's very easy to project what we're seeing going in one of two directions. Okay, uh, one is the all out everything breaks up, everything blows up, everything smashes off. Yeah. Uh, Iran pull pushes all the buttons, pulls all the strings. The Houthis fire everything they have. Hezbollah fires everything they have. Israel is fighting against you know overwhelming odds. And we're talking about a World War III scenario, and, and a lot of people are talking about that. But do the other way around. Let's say Israel finishes off the Hamas in Gaza, which conveys to the world that you can't stand up. Uh, you can't right. attack a, 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 a um, centralized government in that way and leave to tell the tale. All the rest of the organizations are going to realize that. They're going to catch up. Yep. Uh, okay. Hezbollah is going to have a harder time living in, in, in Lebanon with that. The Lebanese don't want them there. Right. Okay. And, and again, so, so you, you become weak. Okay. You show you, you actually, you've seen your weakness. You've shown your weakness in, in the Middle East. So the Houthi, okay, are going to have to think twice about standing up to the United States because if somebody decides, you know, to pull off all. So, so. That's going to create a whole environment where the more man or moderate players, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Gulf states, that were on the verge of that anyway, will come together together with Israel and create a whole new Middle East. Yeah. And that whole new Middle East, again, we can go into prophecy, but it's not, not hard to plug a, a peaceful Middle East into end time prophecy. No, I, I agree. And I think that um, what this does for us is it serves us a, a, as a reminder that God is real, that we're not him, that he is sovereign and in control of everything, and that God will always protect his people. And, and um, when we look to the word to find counsel on these things, I think everything we're seeing happening around us should serve as a reminder of how important, especially in these days, it is to be as close to God as we possibly can. What I like to say, although, is this. Um, you look at what's happening, and you can see the gears and the mechanisms of God's plan being played out Amen. in the world today. Amen. You can actually see the gears. And, and we, 
we, we've been studying these all our lives, and, you know, you're talking about this, and, you know, and it's, it's on the biblical channel, and it's on, you know, the veggie tales, you know, and, but here you're seeing a real-world event. Yes. A real-world biblical event playing out in front of your eyes, and, and I think that's kind of fascinating. And it should wake us up. It should wake us up. More than ever, we should be as close to the Lord as we possibly can. I think as we do that, it reminds us of why we're here, and that is we are literally counting down to eternity. And how much more important is it to stand up for righteousness? How much import, How much more important is it to, to, to take a stand for the things that are right, right? To stand with Israel, to stand with the Lord, to, to, to keep our eyes on the Lord, understand that the days we're living in, we're running out of time. And Ezekiel said it better than anybody else. There's a gap. Yeah. We need the people to stand in the gap right now. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, we're out of time. And I, I think David put it the best. Um, we love you. Uh, this is our very first broadcast of the year for Countdown to Eternity. Welcome and to I, 2024. Amen. And I, and I got to tell you, I cannot tell you how grateful we are that you continue to watch us. Yeah. We love you uh, when you take us on your jogs or in your living rooms or in your cars. Um, you're amazing people. We're grateful to the Lord for you. May you continue to seek his face. May you continue to grow in him. May God's blessing be upon you. May his face shine upon you. We love you. May you be blessed in this great 2024. And I say it's great because we're going to continue to see God's hand manifest in amazing ways. Seek him. We do hope that you guys enjoyed watching this and listening to it as much as we've enjoyed making it. On behalf of David Tall, this is Pastor James Cadiz. We love you, and may you seek him, and may God richly bless you in this new year. We love you. God bless you. Thanks for joining us on this week's Countdown to Eternity. We want to encourage you to visit jamescadiz.com to find additional content and resources to equip you for the spiritual battle that we fight every day. You can also subscribe to James Cadiz over on YouTube and Rumble. If you'd like to support Pastor James and his family directly, visit jamescadiz.locals.com and subscribe there. You'll gain access to exclusive content, daily devotionals, and more. Countdown to Eternity is listener-supported. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you.